everyone, and welcome to today's event, Generative AI, what is the cost for the information industry? Thank you all for joining here in Brussels and online. My name is Molly Killeen. I'm a journalist covering technology, and I will be the moderator of this event. So just a note before we start, there will be a chance for audience questions at the end. So if you have them, you can submit them via Slido using the QR code, which should be on the screen. So it's a very interesting topic that we're here to discuss today, and one that seems to be everywhere you turn at the moment. Um, I think there's... Sorry, is there a way of raising the volume a little bit? I don't hear um, you very... Ah, okay, I can speak, sure speak louder. Um, it's a very interesting topic that we are here to discuss today, and one that seems to be everywhere you turn at the moment. Um, we're looking today at the information industry specifically, which is an area that it seems this kind of content generating, these content generating tools will have a particular impact. Um, and that impact and some of the responses to it are what we're going to talk about. Um, so just to repeat, in case you didn't hear earlier, um, you can submit questions via Slido, and there should be a QR code on the screen which you can scan to do that. Um, so before I introduce our panelists and we get started with the discussion, we're first going to hear some opening remarks from Serena Bressin, who is the project manager at AI for Trust, which is the supporter of, of today's event. So go ahead, Serena. AI for Trust uh, conference entitled Generative AI, what is the cost for information industry? I'm uh, Serena Bressan and I am uh, the project manager of uh, the AI for Trust coordinator, namely the Digital Society Center of the Fondazione Bruno Kessler FBK that is based uh, in Trento, Italy. In the first slide, uh, the overview slide of AI for Trust, you can see the main details of the project. Uh, AI for Trust is uh, second slide. Sorry, uh, <laughs> AI for Trust is uh, a rising Europe project entitled AI-based technologies for trustworthy solution against the disinformation. It aims to utilize artificial intelligence in the battle against disinformation with a duration of 38 months from the 1st of January 2023, the project received, uh, received a substantial new contribution of uh, 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 approximately 6 million euros. It brings together a consortium of 15 partners and two associated partners from 12 European countries. Next slide, please. Increasing evidence shows that disinformation spreading has a detrimental impact on our society and uh, at individual and collective levels. And from public health to climate change, it is of paramount importance to timely identify emerging disinformation signals, such as content from uh, known and reliable sources and uh, new narratives. Uh, especially from online social media, to provide media professionals and policy makers with the transport, the elements to extinguish information outbreaks before they run out of control. However, monitoring and uh, analyzing uh, large volumes of online content is well beyond the capacity of human ability only. In fact, the rate at which this information is produced is much larger than the rate at which it can be analyzed and its effect mitigated. Next slide, please. AI for Trust will uh, therefore provide an hybrid system where machines cooperate with humans, relying on uh, advanced AI solutions against advanced disinformation techniques to support both media professionals and policy makers. Our system will monitor in nearly real time uh, multiple online social platforms, filtering out social noise and analyze multimodal data, for example, video data, text data, audio data, in multiple language, languages with uh, novel AI algorithms while cooperating in a semi or automated way with the international networks of uh, actors. In the next slide, you can see uh, the system, the AI trust system in more detail. Next slide. 
Uh, here you can see various data sources, uh, such as uh, news feeds, uh, user requirements, along with the streams like uh, public discussion on online social platforms that will be taken into account by the AI for Trust project and the AI for Trust system. AI modules will process online social data, including narratives and news feeds, to filter out the relevant information and group similar content based on semantic similarity. If the system has already encountered the underlying narrative but for our fact uh, of interest, their metadata will be used for classification and complex data analysis. Otherwise, the information will be passed on to a reliable AI model responsible for organizing data to be verified and analyzed by our checkers using a semi-automated semi-priority key. In such cases, the fact checkers will adhere to strict verification protocols established by the International Fact Checking Alliance Network and label facts upon API records. This uh, labeling will update the existing database of AI for Trust and facilitate further analysis. Then the output will be reviewed by researchers and professionals through the lens of uh, social sciences to identify new sociological and behavioral indicators that can be used in explainable AI based solutions. Additionally, these elements will provide the necessary information for end users to make informed judgments about uh, these contents. Finally, the AI for Trust Open Observatory platform will incorporate the elements they offer and offer a user-friendly interactive dashboard for searching, organizing, and accessing reliable knowledge, serving uh, media professionals, media professionals, and policymakers, and also the reserve community. The final slide, please. So. We can expect that uh, this uh, system, based on uh, a human-centered approach to technology uh, that is aligned with the European social and ethical values, will be integrated into the standard toolbox of data analysts around Europe working on this information. In this regard, I want to leave you with some questions and reflections on the huge impact of AI to face the challenges for a European resilient society. In order for uh, that to be a positive impact, we need to act now and to be strong advocates of transparency and responsibility in AI. An AI that has been uh, thoroughly tested that it is uh, explainable uh, to citizens, to professionals, to employees, uh, and further users, and that has all the ethical considerations in place. The European Commission aims to address the risk generated by specific uses of AI through a set of rules, such as the GDPR and the European Parliament Resolution of 2021 on AI in criminal law. And, as you know, obviously, lawmakers hope to adopt the final AI Act before the end of 2023. There is a variety of privacy and ethical concerns in the works of AI on which I would propose that you also reflect today, such as, for example, data persistence. For instance, data, once created, may potentially persist longer than the human that created it, given the low cost of storing such data. Secondly, data repurposing. It is not clear how such data could be used in the future. Thirdly, data spillovers. There are potential spillovers for others who did not create such data. To limit these risks, the study of effective and efficient data anonymization and pseudo anonymization techniques is the first step. Secondly, a recurring criticism of AI technology is the opacity of algorithms, which makes the causal relationship between input and output difficult to track. Without this understanding of where a decision comes from, public trust in the, in the technology will continue to be limited. Finally, a new transversal challenge 
is to understand how to prevent and combat online and offline threats without the need for uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, data collection and storage. Also through the definition of a set of common standards and good practices for internal access restriction, anonymization and data minimization, allowing a proportionate data collection, reducing the risk of misuse of collected data and respecting the fundamental rights of the European Union, especially the protection of personal data. Next slide, please. I hope that uh, this uh, first presentation and introduction uh, was okay for you and also my final reflection could be useful for you and for your panel. And thank you very much to you all and enjoy the first AI for Trust conference. Thank you. So uh, now we're going to move on to our panelists um, and I will just introduce them before they give some opening remarks. So first up, we have Yodanka Ivanova, who is a legal and policy officer on artificial intelligence, policy development and coordination at DG Connect, the commission's digital department. Next, we have Dan Nashita, who is head of cabinet for MEP Dragos Tudorake, who is the Civil Liberties, the Civil Liberties Committee's rapporteur for the AI Act. After Dan is Andrea G. Rodriguez, who is Lead Digital Policy Analyst at the European Policy Centre. Then also online we have Matthias Spielkamp, who is Executive Director, Co-Founder and Shareholder at Algorithm Watch. Next up we have Jeremy Rollison, who is Senior Director and Head of EU Policy and Government Affairs at Microsoft. And finally, also online, we have Gina Neff, who is the Executive Director of the Mindaroo Centre for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge. So welcome to you all. Um, I'm now going to give you each the floor just to introduce yourselves and give some opening statements. So Yodanka, go ahead. Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation and this very interesting uh, debate. Um, so just to start from the commission perspective, uh, generative AI systems like, like ChatGPT offers great opportunities, uh, but also new risks and challenges. And the impact is revolutionary for all sectors, including for the information society, which is the topic of today's discussion. Um, it's remarkable that key technology players have called for four First time, please regulate us. This technology is too powerful to be left unregulated. And this is exactly what we are doing in the EU with the first comprehensive regulation on AI that we proposed two years ago, uh, which will complement our uh, digital toolbox. Um, we want to promote trust and innovation to maximize the opportunities while also mitigating the risks. Uh, uh, now, general purpose and generative AI systems are at the center of the legislative discussions for the guardrails needed to ensure it is used for good and does not harm, because we've seen also that it has the potential for both. And we are very happy that uh, the European Parliament has progressed very swiftly and now put forward an ambitious proposal. Um, and we are all waiting for the plenary vote tomorrow and the kickoff uh, of the trialogues. Um, given the urgency, our priority is to finalize the negotiations by the end of this year. And the Commission will do everything to support the co-legislators to achieve this objective and also to make Europe fit for the digital age and set a standard globally. So I'll stop here and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Dan, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you also for, for the invitation. I hope you, you all can hear me well without the, the echo. And apologies for the video. You get an extra EU flag uh, to cover the light coming in. Um, it's, still, it's still not optimal. Uh, I will try to, to make it up by, uh, uh, by what I say. Uh, so indeed, as your Danka pointed out, the parliament uh, worked on um, generative AI um, under two different areas. So first area was that even before uh, the generative AI craze uh, got to the public and mainstream, we had uh, concerns about AI used, as mentioned earlier, for disinformation, for manipulation, 
And so we had the foresight, even in the, in the original amendment phase, to propose amendments dealing with what we back then called AI authors, that is, AI that would produce sophisticated text. Uh, then, of course, um, DALI and ChatGPT and MidJourney and all the other uh, uh, now well-known names in generative AI appeared, which allowed the parliament to pay more attention to this issue and to, uh, and to introduce text that I'm happy to hear the commission is, is also uh, interested in and, uh, and uh, likely to support. Um, I will leave most of the substantive for the part for the Q&A, but I do want to say that we're, we're very happy with, with the text that we have right now. It finds a balance between regulating, that is putting some rules, and as Yordanka mentioned, uh, these rules are um, addressing different risks than the initial AI we were trying to regulate but also on the other hand, stimulating other opportunities. And we're hoping, um, we're hoping that uh, everything goes smoothly. I mean, we're confident that everything goes smoothly tomorrow with, with the vote and we'll be uh, entering trialogues actually the same day after the vote uh, and moving forward, hoping to, to finish the text of this uh, uh, regulation by the, uh, by the end of the year. I'll stop here, but then I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion. Great, thanks, Dan. No, Andrea? Thank you very much, uh, Molly. I'm going to try to build on the statements that that were um, already uh, in the topics that have been already discussed. Um, I'm leading the digital policy part of, uh, of um, the European uh, Political Economy uh, Department at the European Policy Center, which is, uh, we're one of the biggest think tanks in town. Uh, which uh, which means that we work with like a different um, like different stakeholders that are like right now like hands on uh, digital policy on generative AI. There is like a couple of things I wanted to mention. The first is uh, that it's not a new thing. So we've been seeing um, different technological developments over the last five, six, seven years that have um, been enabling this conversation over time. So this is not something that just happened with the chat GPT, and I think that Dan um, mentioned that correctly when he mentioned, for example, Wally, which is a model of 2021. But what it's uh, new, it's, it's two things. Like the first one is it's an issue of outreach. So uh, for example, ChatGPT in the first two months uh, had um, 100 million active users, which is a lot of people. It's basically a third of the European population, which at the end of the day, it creates like a new set of risks and challenges. And I think that the timing for this conversation, it's, uh, it's, it's perfect. It couldn't be more relevant uh, than uh, also announced that the, the plenary vote is tomorrow, because I think that right now, if we see what is happening in Europe with digital regulation, uh, generative AI, is an opportunity for EU to do two things. The first one is to test current like legislative proposals, because uh, the fact that we're having this conversation right now, before we go on the trialogues, uh, it's a test for for current re regulative proposals to see if they're fit for purpose. Also considering that this is the conversation we're having today, but we don't know what conversation we'll, we'll be having in six months or a year time. So I think this is something that we need to bear in mind. Also, I think it's interesting to notice that um, that the challenges that we'll be facing or that we are currently facing with generative AI, they're like much wider than the ones that, that, that we can see with other like AI uh, models and systems. I don't want to get into them because that's something that we need to do for the conversation, but just like to broaden a little bit the scope because of the outreach, because of the nature, and obviously because of the challenges. Um, not only this is an opportunity for Europe to lead, but also to lead in other international fora. And, and then like try to uh, attract all the countries who are right now looking to Europe to see how they're gonna develop their like AI regulatory frameworks in the future. Great, thank you. Um, so next up, uh, Matthias, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much also from my side for the invitation. Um, Algorithm Watch is a nonprofit civil society watchdog looking at algorithmic systems. That's what we call them, uh, just in case, you know, that um, in Brussels, not everyone here in the uh, conversation knows what we are doing. 
Um, so um, why am I saying this? Because I'm a journalist and I've worked as a journalist my entire life, basically. I include uh, Algorithm Watch here because since its beginning, we also did journalistic reporting. And we are doing this by using quite highly developed software, for example, when we program um, systems like uh, plugins for browsers that users can then use to donate data to us so we can analyze what, for example, the platform's algorithms are doing without asking them for their consent or for their data, which hasn't really been successful over the last couple of years. Uh, most of the time, they are um, trying to, um, let's say, um, uh, protect their own uh, information that they're gathering on how the platforms work, and they're not very forthcoming with that. Um, so um, having said this, I do think that AI um, technologies like generative AI that we are discussing at the moment can be helpful in what journalists and uh, media are doing. But at the same time, I would encourage everyone to look a little bit at the broader picture that we are facing at the moment. And that is, um, I'd say, uh, a pretty bleak one. Um, and that is the combination of factors that we are confronted with. Because on the one hand, we have these systems that are being released, have been released way too early to uh, a general audience. Um, I uh, definitely criticize that. These were not ready for the market. Um, and you can see that by looking at all the discussions that are happening in the media and uh, on social networks, where people are showing examples of um, when these systems sort of spit out entirely erroneous information, um, which I think is irresponsible. You know, it was very irresponsible to, um, to do this. Um, and this also includes uh, Microsoft, who implemented this into their Bing search engine very early on. And um, many of us are aware of the consequences that there were con um, conversations happening that we shouldn't see. And this is meeting a market that has been sort of sucked dry over the last uh, 20 years by all the ad money going to some dominant platforms, which in this case is not Microsoft, but Google and Facebook. Um, so here we have sort of a, a perfect storm of not having enough resources for journalistic reporting. And in the, on the other hand, uh, large players dominating the legal, uh, the, the digital market um, and behaving, as I said, quite irresponsibly. So um, from that perspective, I think regulation is, is uh, necessary and overdue. What we can expect from the AI Act, I wouldn't want to comment here in my first remarks. What I would like to highlight is that the DSA, the Digital Services Act, is already in place and platforms have to deliver their first risk assessments under this framework until August. And I expect that these risk assessments also um, look at, or the companies doing the risk assessments um, need to look at the implementation of, for example, these generative AI models into their services that um, they have been um, announcing over the last couple of months. So this should be a very, very important aspect. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hear then what you know, we are not going to see the risk assessments ourselves immediately, but what the Commission will tell us about how they address this. Great, thank you. Um, oh, Jeremy, go ahead. Hi, and thanks for the chance to be here today. I'm Jeremy Rollison. I manage our EU policy team here in Brussels. Um, I have spent a lot of time working on what I refer to as data policy, and now obviously it's a conversation around AI that is picking up pace over the past few months um, for reasons that everyone has mentioned. I think the release of many of these products and services, you know, it's, we consider it in a, a year which is an inflection point for artificial intelligence. I, I like to say that, you know, when my mother is starting to use these technologies, it is getting real now. We've been talking about it for quite some time, but it's becoming much more prevalent even in a day to day. And I think you've seen some, some leaps forward with some of the possibilities in that space. You know, I, I think it's always important to say, too, that, you know, what the focus on generative AI, and, and, and naturally so, and I know that's the topic of today, you know, it is a much, AI is much, much bigger than just one use case and one particular product or service, and sometimes the things that have been grabbing headlines, we need to be careful, I think, when we're regulating, that we're not regulating all of AI for one type of model. And But today, with generative AI, I, I do think that's been where we've seen a lot of excitement, and I think we recognize the fact that 
you know, this can be misused and it can be used, you know, for a tremendous amount of opportunities. I think you'll hear us talk more and more about, you know, emphasizing the, the co-pilot aspect of this and we, other products and services where this can really, you know, make tasks much more efficient, you know, even drive more and more creativity. Um, it's a tool. Now, at the same time, it can be misused and we need to mitigate against those risks. Uh, we've joined others in highlighting you know, some of the key principles that you know, regulation would need to follow in that space, and it's a conversation that is happening even globally now. I do think the EU is leading in that space with, again, a proposal for like the first horizontal, horizontal set of binding rules. Uh, very, very timely, and you can imagine that you know, technology moves fast, and I think the discussions and the debates and Parliament and elsewhere have, have tried to keep pace with that, and I think we recognize it. We want to make sure that any obligations are, of course, practical, um, but we, we do want to be a part of that discussion because I think it needs to have the guardrails and the safeguards that we've talked about. And I, I would agree with others who have said that you know you want to make sure there's rules in place to enhance that type of trust. Um, but it is, you know, obviously striking a balance. You know, we think this has tremendous opportunity. Uh, we're seeing that in rollouts from you know, enterprise customers and others. There's more and more excitement about this. I think this has a tremendously, you know, impactful potential and we're seeing that now in the first year so it's going to continue to accelerate and I think the EU is leading the way with that and we're looking forward to seeing how those discussions continue. Great thank you um, and finally Gina. Thank you and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm going to just ensure that there's no echo on the call. Uh, we're really having a very different conversation about chat GPT um, and generative AI that we've had about AI over the last two to three years. The last six weeks have felt like an eternity in terms of the conversations that public um, are, are, are having, the conversations in the media. I think this means that more people are now asking about what this means for our lives and our world and our society. And, and it's asked, more people are asking about the impact on trusted information. And what's bringing us here today together is to help talk through these issues um, under the umbrella of the AI for Trust program, which I'm a part of and leading a work package around policy impact. So one of the things that really worries me about the, the most recent developments is the potential for significant impact around misuse uh, by bad actors and around increasing mis and disinformation on elections, on health, on climate information. And as a social scientist, this concerns me because it, it affects how people will come to trust one another. So uh, just as Jeremy said, there's really phenomenal um, ways that these technologies will make our lives better, make our jobs easier, but there's so much work to be done to make sure that our information systems will work for people. So everybody in this room um, really should be worrying about how people are going to get good, high quality information in the generative AI age. And it's that a good information that people are relying on to make the decisions that matter about the, their lives. That's really the problem that AI for Trust is trying to tackle. And I think it's a problem we need more people and more projects and, and more work, both from um, research civil society, industry, and yes, government and regulation, we need that collaboration to tackle this problem. So uh, Serena told us a little bit about the AI for Trust program. I just want to make a, a, a shout out, as an American would say, a call to our sister programs, um, Vera AI, Titan, and AI for Media. And I'll um, also, um, bring you into some of the things that we're doing both in AI for Trust, but in other kinds of science and research efforts. So um, AI for Media is exciting because it's really helping to establish the networking infrastructure that's going to bring together the European AI landscape in the field of media. 
And we need those kinds of collaborations right now to make sure we have responsible and trustworthy AI. Um, it, those long running interactions between academia and industry are only fostered when we have um, that ability to, to collaborate on, on, on problems. Um, both AI for Media and Vera AI, along with Titan, are sister programs to AI for Trust. We're all funded through the EU Horizon program, and we're all trying to tackle in different ways various parts of the problem that um, we see from this and disinformation. So Vera AI is exciting because it's really helping to build professional, trustworthy AI solutions against advanced disinformation techniques created, co-created with and for media professionals and researchers. And so we really think this could be the foundation for future research in the area of AI against disinformation. And then AI for trust, and this brings me to the call that I'm asking all of you in that room there, in this virtual room together. AI for Trust, in, in our efforts to create better tools for recognizing and countering mis- and disinformation, we really need to understand how policymakers and others will use these tools in the work that you do, whether your work is in um, the technology space, whether your work is in health, whether your work is in science, whether your work is in, in, in work and labor. There's, there's um, quite a bit that will change in terms of policymaking. So one of the calls that I have um, um, for everyone in the audience is we're looking for um, helping to inform the design of this platform with policy and decision makers. So if you're seeing yourself in that category and you can give us one hour of your time please, during the next four weeks, please contact me or Emmanuel Azega, who is sitting in Brussels with you, and sign up for an interview or a focus group to talk to us about what you would want to see in, in these. And finally, if you're a scientist or a researcher, um, particularly those working in academia and you're sitting in the room, there's a recently launched international panel on the information environment, ipie.info. It's an independent global organization that's dedicated to providing actionable scientific knowledge on the threats to our information landscape. So this goes beyond the EU to try to have these conversations with um, hundreds of leading scientists worldwide, really putting into policymaker hands, the hands of policymakers, industry leaders, and civil society, these kinds of invaluable insights that are going to make the global information environment better. So I don't think these problems of generative AI are going to be resolved quickly or easily. I do think it's going to take more of us to be um, working together for solutions, and I'm looking forward to the discussion to see what comes out of today's okay. meeting. Great, thank you, Gina. Um, so we can turn to the discussion now, but um, as Gina mentioned, um, interaction is very important. So just to remind you that you can submit your questions via Slido using the QR code, and we will come to them a bit later. But um, to start with, I'd like to turn to your Danke just for a kind of bigger picture look at things. Um, the Commission presented its AI Act proposal in 2021, and obviously the conversation has developed quite a lot since then. Um, if you were looking to present the proposal again now, um, or for the first time now, would you, would you be um, including protections that were quite targeted or provisions that were targeted at generative AI and what might those look like? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I hope the, now you hear me well and there is no echo. But indeed, um, two years is a lot of time. So especially with these fast technological developments, uh, we now see different landscapes. So of course, if we were now putting forward a proposal, I think we would be looking very carefully at, at those issues. And um, to be frank with you, they are not so easy to actually regulate because as, as was also said, uh, indeed, we need also future-proof frameworks, effective frameworks that can 
on one hand, not overregulate or stifle innovation uh, and promote the opportunities, but also mitigate risks in a way that are actually future-proof and effective for also types of technologies that are also to come in the next years. So these are all very, very challenging uh, tasks. And um, I think if we had more time, of course, we would have followed the regular legislative process, doing impact assessments, working with industry and I think now we all understand that we really have to work fast and actually the original commission proposal um, and the framework we set up is already a very good basis to build on it because we we do have to deal with the general purpose and generative AI systems but we also have to deal with risks in very specific context. So I think now also in the legislative process and also with all the discussions with stakeholders, academia, industry, as I said in the opening statement, it, it, this dialogue with uh, key technology players like Microsoft here, who are here, but also civil society organizations have been extremely rich uh, during these two years. Uh, and I think um, also we have moved a lot also at the international level with the international discussion. So with, with all these discussions and with the basic framework that both co-legislators agree, um, we are very confident that we can work out the, the right solutions, the right guardrails uh, and safeguards um, also during the trilogues um, and make um, indeed the regulation achieving the two objectives to both promote innovation, be targeted, promote uh, proportionate, but also address the big societal risks uh, and challenges uh, and, and also build trust, uh, including in the information society. Um, and there are already relevant provisions that are there in our proposal for transparency of AI content um, uh, and deep fakes, um, but, but also other risk frameworks that could be built upon and could be a very good basis for, for, for the final solutions. Great, thank you. Um, and I know that Gina needs to leave slightly earlier, so maybe we can turn to her next. Um, and you mentioned disinformation in your opening statement, um, and there's been quite a lot of attention to the potential for generative AI to create this kind of content on a much larger scale than we've seen at the moment. Um, last week, the commission announced that signatories to the code of practice on disinformation would be required to label AI-generated content. So what are your thoughts on where responsibility lies in terms of dealing with this, maybe when the content's been generated in one place, but then is being hosted by platforms? Listen, we have so much to work out in terms of these problems. So where does responsibility lie? It's, it's going to be with all of us. There are clearly guardrails that need to be in place for understanding how information is being used um, uh, is being generated and used. There are clearly um, responsibilities that companies need to do to make sure that their products are safe and effective and do what they purport to do. And there's responsibilities that um, those of us have in research, education, civil society to build the social capacity for using these technologies um, well and understanding what we're looking at. So I um, appreciate Jeremy's uh, comments earlier about Copilot and, um, and uh, the integration of generative text and automated text into enterprise products. Um, we um, absolutely need to be aware of the risks of what putting these powerful tools in people's hands will, um, will do. Now, um, sorting my email and having quick, um, short, um, uh, safe responses, that's great. We're all going to love that. Um, um, having things that um, misrepresent uh, me, misrepresent the world, misrepresent um, things about me, that's um, what we're not going to want. So I think we, in, in terms of regulation, we need to remember that we're, we're going to fight this problem no longer just in text, but in visual information, in um, coming experiential and haptic information, 
and coming um, in, in, in audio, in video, et cetera. So it's going to be a multimodal fight that we don't yet have the technical tools to deal with. So we can't simply rely on a text-based um, uh, vision for these regulations, a text-based vision for technology development, we're going to need to get really granular on people's perceptions and what people experience and what people need in order to be able to use these tools and navigate our information environments safely. And given that, Jeremy, you mentioned in your opening um, that there are a lot of opportunities um, for this kind of technology to help us be more creative or more efficient. Um, but that is potentially, it's potentially risky in areas like journalism where accuracy is very important, but things are moving very quickly. So in sectors like this, how can we work out where this technology can be safely incorporated versus where maybe it shouldn't be used? Sure. Listen, I, I agree with just about everything Gina just mentioned. I think she laid it out really well. You know, there's a, there's a balance to be struck here. And I think where, those are, where there are risks, and if you're talking about misinformation, and get right to your question about you know, journalism, I think there's a lot of things you can do. There are standards which are emerging already around you know, content prominence and authenticity. I think there will be watermarking techniques. I think the transparency requirements, even in the AI Act, are aimed at making sure uh, folks know when they're interacting with an AI-generated piece of content or an AI system. And I think where the co-pilot reference comes in, though, is you know, where the line is drawn there is just going to be important, and I'm not even taking a view on it, but the extent to which a journalist can leverage AI to create part of a story, combining it with other sources, you know, where is the output going to be fully AI, partly generated by AI, you know, some of those lines are going to continue to see discussions around and the like, but I think transparency requirements and some of the standards that are already in development around watermarking and provenance um, is the first place to start. You know, I think everyone has a responsibility to not only be transparent about when they're using these tools to generate this, but also I think there's a lot of education and skills that should go, should be invested in also to make sure that people understand when they can identify signs that they're interacting with that type of content as well. So I think it's going to be um, a continued conversation. I don't think you can come up with a proposal in one law or another that solves this problem magically, but I think as journalists in particular continue to use these technologies and roll out some of these tools, uh, we'll start to see where the best place to put those lines are, but a combination of standards and transparency, I think. Great. And Andrea, another area of quite a lot of concern, especially for people working in the creative industries, is the copyright implications mm -hmm. of generative AI models that might be incorporating their work. Um, and the Parliament's version of the AI Act AI Act does include um, transparency obligations to make it clear when copyrighted material has been used. Um, but do you think this is enough uh, to protect the work of, of people working in these sectors? Well, I mean, I think that obviously copyright is a very, very big topic and I want to fully disclose here that I'm not a lawyer. So um, there's like plenty of things that I would not be able to say, but it's, uh, it's true that um, probably like copyright is one of the most urgent issues to be tackled, yet not the only one. So just the, thinking about the multiplicity of risks and challenges that generative AI poses, not only for the creative industry, but also for other types of, of industries, I would say that we could summarize them in, in four big buckets, if we want to say it this way. So we have a big uh, fairness challenge that needs to be, to be tackled, such as um, the power of generative AI to amplify bias or to distribute like harmful content. Like uh, this information was already mentioned before and that's like cer certainly another big concern that we have. Uh, other thing is transparency, yes, like imposing transparency obligations precisely on copyright, it's, it's good, but how about do we explain to people that this uh, content has been, like, you know, like how do we make sure that people understand what generative AI is, what the impact will have on, on what they're doing, on, you know, so those type of things I think is very interesting. Um, Jeremy mentioned before of transparency obligations in the AI Act. I think it's, very, it's a very interesting topic and certainly it gives a lot of, um, I mean, of tools for the people to know when AI is used on them, but I would be interested in knowing, for example, what Matthias thinks about, uh, about this, right? Like, how do we make sure that the transparency obligations that we're imposing do really have a, an impact on the societal impl implications of 
AI as well, like because we're seeing that general, I think, on every uh, type of, of technology over reliance by the population. Like it's fine, this was made uh, by an AI system, but what does that mean? Does it mean that it can trust the content? Because uh, I think there is also a, a question there on reliability that was brought up before. Um, also, uh, copyright is a good angle to, to tackle that, but there's like many other things uh, that could come from that. How about like competition? Because uh, so I think that to summarize a little bit, because uh, we don't have all the time in the world, it's um, promising that, uh, that this was included in the AI Act because it was identified as the most urgent issue, yet is it something that is gonna solve, solve all the problems coming from generative AI? I doubt it, but it doesn't mean that the AI Act does not have instruments in place to solve some of the other issues that I, I have mentioned. Great, thanks, um, and we will come to Matthias in just a moment, but I think first, um, if we just turn to Dan, who has obviously worked very closely on the development of the Parliament's position on the AI Act, um, maybe you could give us some insight into all these uh, provisions and measures that we've mentioned so far, into why they were included in the form that they are, and also whether ahead of tomorrow's vote you're expecting any um, significant amendments. Yes, definitely. And I, I think I resonate with, with everybody who intervened so far in, you know, what needs to be done. But I want to start uh, also with the positive spin on this technology. So I will go back to what's in the AI Act and what the Parliament has added, but it does open up, uh, you know, a, a trove of possibilities that we shouldn't ignore including for the creative sectors and uh, the publishing sector and for journalists uh, and so on. Now with that caveat, just to, to, to add the flavor to the discussion, I'll go back to the rules because of course in the AI Act, uh, the commission proposed and then parliament and council are working on rules and these are obligation and the obligations are in place to prevent some of the risks. So I think that the solution that we have found for generative AI is multi-layered, not just uh, as Jeremy was, was earlier saying, transparency, which was already there and we think it's good. I'll try to describe it, uh, you know, the way we see it and, and the way our office sees how we tackle generative AI to make it safe to use in, uh, in Europe. So first, in the AI Act, the Parliament has added provisions on some light touch but important obligations for generative AI in particular. There's three of them. So one is indeed transparency, knowing when the content, any type of generative content, be it uh, video, uh, sound, images, text, uh, has been uh, generated with artificial intelligence. Then the second one is a state of the art, best effort on behalf of the developers to put guardrails in place against the generation of content that is blatantly illegal in the union. So what we had in mind is uh, safeguards against generating child pornography, for example, uh, instructions on how to uh, attack uh, the cyber infrastructure of a city and so on. Uh, all of these uh, safeguards, we feel that they should be mandated at the development phase of, of such uh, generative AI. Then, of course, on the issue of copyright, and I'm not a lawyer either, but the way we saw it was increased transparency rather than changing the copyright law using the AI Act. So we're not touching on existing copyright legislation, but we're saying to the developers of generative AI, hey, be transparent about the copyrighted material that you use in training your models. And these three are specifically related to, to generative AI. But then there is another layer, which is of course the entire discussion on foundation models, that is the powerful models that are not solely used for, for generative AI, but we encounter them mostly uh, nowadays in, in uh, producing generative, uh, generative AI systems. And there we have obligations 
that we feel are common sense that could be met by the providers of these models because these models are very powerful. They're used in many downstream uses that make those models safer uh, and more reliable when they get put on the market. Uh, and when they then are used to, to build generative AI or in other downstream applications. So these are all new uh, provisions that we've added in the text. And I would add what, uh, what Yordanka also hinted at, that this is not a problem that will be solved only with the regulation in the European Union. And it's very encouraging that at, you know, <clears throat> within at least the like-minded countries of the world, there is a, a growing awareness that, that this is an issue where we need international convergence, right? So the outcome of the G7 meeting was very encouraging. The outcome of the Trade and Technology Council with the United States was, was also very encouraging. So I'm really hoping that what we do in the AI Act will be complemented with these international efforts to get to a sort of convergence uh, at the international level. And here, this is not just to, to Microsoft, but all the big players out there. Here, I think that companies and providers of these uh, generative AI systems have an increased responsibility to sit at the table and to, to co-create and to understand the regulators, the authorities, what they are trying to, to prevent but also be responsible in the way that they develop this AI so that, that, that this is done in, you know, in agreement with industry. I'm happy to have seen these calls for regulation, but they're not enough. Uh, it's not just passively, please regulate us. It should be, let us work together so that we make sure that this technology is safe and that can really bring benefits to our economies and society. Okay, great, thank you. And so now maybe we can turn to Matthias and just hear some of your reactions to the AI Act and to some of the um, concerns that have been raised and how well you think the legislation will address them. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, of course, one of the toughest questions to answer at the moment. But I would like first to come back to a comment that uh, Jordanka has made and uh, she referenced the rich discussion that uh, the commission had with um, the civil society and also the companies. And I would like just to highlight here um, the results of a report that was put together by uh, Corporate Europe Observatory and Lobby Control um, that analyzed uh, how the lobbying went when um, it was about the Digital Services Act. And companies spent over 97 million euros annually lobbying the EU institutions which is a, mo a lot more than pharma, fossil fuels, finance, and chemicals. So, uh, and Microsoft was in third place there after Facebook and Google. So I can imagine uh, with 75% of the meetings on the DSA that were led by corporations, uh, what that rich discussion looked like and uh, what the um, um, power asymmetry here is. I think we can't leave this out of the discussion when we are talking about regulation and uh, what needs to be done. And, and Jeremy, you said, that um, we need to make clear that there is transparency and that the systems cannot be misused. And uh, from what I understood, your comments were um, aimed at uh, people who would use, for example, the generative AI models as a, you know, as a company or probably even as an end user. And I would argue that the first misuse that we have seen was the premature release of uh, ChatGPT and then also the implementation into Microsoft technology. And I think uh, this is an aspect that we can't leave out of the discussion here when we're looking at what is the development at the moment, because I do think it's an opportunity here from the, um, first of all, the Commission side, but also um, the Parliament. And Dan, thank you very much for these remarks. I uh, basically agree with uh, uh, all of what you said, um, including the idea that there needs to be international alignment. But first of all, we need to come to clear guidelines on the European side, because that's what we can influence um, most effectively. And that we hear then, and this uh, then uh, comes back to the, to the question and the um, comment by, by Dan and Jordanka, that we have um, trust in the suppliers of the models themselves, 
And we are not so much looking at the users because, I mean, we need to look at the users as well. And the user here I use in this language of the AI Act, which are the companies who then implement these technologies in their own products. It's not us as the users. Uh, we are more like the affected uh, persons who then um, either benefit or suffer from the use of these technologies. That um, it, it, is, it is important if we want to be able to trust the suppliers of these models that there are clear due diligence requirements, uh, risk assessment, but also, of course, risk mitigation and risk avoidance. You know, we are talking a lot about risk mitigation, which presupposes that, oh, there will always be a risk and we can only mitigate it. Yes, I mean, that's true in most walks of life, uh, but there can be more an, a more ambitious approach um, looking at how we can actually avoid some of the risks that these technologies um, come with. And uh, last comment on that, um, you uh, also said that uh, we need to look at the market and how it's composed. And I, again, uh, agree with that a lot. Um, I think we um, need to look at competition policy and, con and uh, market control here uh, more clearly, because what we are facing is a dominance by, again, a couple of very large companies who have access to um, the development of this and to the resources that are needed to develop these technologies. And they then dominate a market uh, where you know, other companies can compete on the application layer, but not so much on the layer of the model. And I think this would be a bad development for society and all of us. Um, and so I think this also needs to be addressed in addition to the due diligence, transparency, and risk mitigation ideas that are already now proposed by um, the European Parliament. Great. Um, so there might be some things that Jeremy wants to respond to there. But first, um, Dan has to leave quite shortly. So um, maybe we can just turn to him for a final question. Um, you mentioned a um, kind of global aspect and a global attention to this. And uh, we do have a question that came through about um, the cross-border use of AI. So maybe um, you could... Uh, there have also been a lot of different initiatives that have come out, not just at EU level, but um, at national and international. So maybe you could just say a little bit more about um, the extent to which there is an alignment globally on, on how to address this issue and also any of the challenges when it comes to kind of coordinating all these moving parts. Definitely. So um, I echo first what Matthias was saying, that what we have um, right now as a tool at our disposal is European legislation. So of course, the, the other layer at the international level has to be at the political level, has to be a concerted diplomatic effort to get an uh, you know, I will I will be a little uh, blunt here and say that I do believe that it needs to start with the democracies of the world, uh, because uh, a global uh, effort from day one uh, would be very difficult. But I think that slowly and uh, within this community of democracies, we can get slowly to a certain consensus in in what the let's say principles, uh, not rules, uh, are. And, I, and I, I, I know that there are challenges because the question was about challenges. Uh, so one of them is literally different regulatory traditions. So it is interesting to see that the Americans are now really thinking about uh, AI and generative AI of course, stimulated by, by the recent developments in, in recent months, but they have a different way of regulating. It's not the way we regulate. Nevertheless, we feel that once we get to uh, the same principles, uh, based on the same values and on the, sh on the same objectives that we're trying to achieve uh, with different regulatory instruments, I think that that is a very, very good place to start. Um, now, how do we do that? We do it. Uh, one, at the very technical level, by aligning on standards, right? Because standards are underpinning uh, 
even the, the AI Act uh, at a very practical uh, com compliance level. Uh, then aligning on, on, on the principles and the values, and I think that we're, we're getting there. And then, of course, somehow getting to an agreement that is, uh, that is more or less formal and that, that includes, as I said, uh, to a certain extent, companies uh, with, with a soft obligation, but nevertheless, that, that will lead to more convergence uh, in in respecting those those principles, and yes, I, I do have to jump off. It's it's a couple of crazy days here with the with the debate coming up soon. I encourage everybody to watch it uh, today at one on on the AI Act, uh, and then the vote tomorrow. And I know I skipped by mistake a question. Uh, what do I expect at uh, at the vote? I think it's going to go okay, and we'll get our mandate uh, probably in the same form that that you have seen adopted in, in committee. And then we'll move right into trialogues, uh, as I said, the same, uh, the same day. Now, because this section and this whole conversation on generative AI, and as I said, foundation models, is a new addition to, to the AI Act that the parliament has proposed, I do want to encourage everybody here, but also listening in, to look at those proposals carefully and to send us and the commission and council their proposals to, to improve it so that, uh, and, and, you know, there's openness from the commission, as your Danka said, there is, I know that there's openness from council to, to have something in the text about these. So now is a good time for everybody to send in feedback so that by the uh, end of the trialogues, we have a very good text on one hand, tackling all the challenges and, and the new risks, but on the other hand, making sure that, that we're also supporting innovation and, and leveraging this technology in, in our societies. So once again, thank you all very much. Uh, and this was a very, very good conversation. Uh, and let's, uh, you know, let's keep in touch for, uh, for the next steps in, in the process. Great, thanks, Dan, and thank you for joining today. Um, so maybe turning to Jeremy now, um, Matthias raised a lot of points in response to what you'd said. So um, if you'd like to respond to any of them, and maybe particularly on this question of how we can build trust in the providers of these technologies and any uh, steps we're taking to preempt some of these risks and mitigate. Sure. I, I think one thing that several other panelists mentioned, and I think it's an important thing to keep in mind in the regulatory conversation is, you know, this is several layers of a technology stack, you know, and every layer has a pretty integral part in releasing or developing something that ultimately we call, you know, an AI system. So you have an infrastructure layer, you have the application layer, you have a deployment layer, and that's getting more and more, you know, complex uh, naturally because these are models that can be used by others to train other models and there's APIs. It, it's not always as, as simple as I think sometimes we, we may reference, but I mention that only because when you think about the type of risk that could be in place and who's closer to that, what layer may be closer to that in terms of avoiding it altogether, as Matthias has said, you know, I think you want to make sure that it's, it's practical in that sense, you know, at the application layer where some of the choices may be made to go in a high risk direction or low risk direction. It's only natural there that there would be certain obligations. Now at that layer, they may not be able to fulfill certain obligations if they're relying on systems that they haven't developed. So again, then at the development layer, there needs to be a different set of obligations. So I think that balance, and I think the Commission's proposal actually recognize, you know, different layers of that. And I think the Parliament and Council have both tried to get on that. Um, Listen, we've, you know, at Microsoft in particular, we've launched a responsible AI standard that we've actually made publicly available, and that comes with impact assessments, templates that others can use. It talks about the way we bake that into all of the development we're doing internally. We're sharing that experience with others. I think also one point that hasn't come up is that people will only use the systems that they trust, and there is a competitive space there. And I think you know, the systems that perform the best, the systems that perform the most accurately and the most reliably are ultimately going to be the ones that are relied upon more than others. So you have almost an inherent motivation to be building these things in that way. Uh, but it's going to be a combination of things. It is going to be the regulatory guardrails that we talked about. I think I agree with what Dan and others were saying, that we do all have a responsibility to come together and, and make sure that that's set up the right way. 
uh, at the technology level, at the democratic level, at the legal level. It's always going to be a balance. And I think you'll get different views there about where we get it right. Um, it won't finish with just one proposal. You know, it will continue. This will continue to touch upon policy spaces that we've talked about for years, whether that's privacy, whether it's intellectual property, uh, competition, what have you. So I think it's going to be ongoing. The, when the AI Act is adopted, that will not be the end of AI regulation by any means. And I think as more and more of these launches take place and more and more customers and users roll out new ways of viewing this, we'll, we'll learn about some of the, the misuses as well. Um, but I think we're going to also you know, see a lot of benefits to something like this. And that's exactly why we're trying to get the balance right. And again, we're happy to be a part of that conversation. Great, thanks. Um, so we are approaching the end of the um, event. So we'll turn to some audience questions in just a minute. So now is the last chance to submit any if you have them. Um, but before that, Andrea, this technology is developing very quickly, but the regulatory process is slightly slower. Um, so it'll still be a while before the AI Act is finalized and in place. Um, do you have any concerns about how far the technology might have developed by the time all these rules are being enforced? And should we be looking at any alternative or parallel approaches to regulating? I think that is a very, very good question, right? And um, well, if we're thinking about AI, that's the question to ask, but how about other technologies that are being developed? How are we preparing to create like governance frameworks to basically try to mitigate the risks that will be emerging? I think that the AI Act in particular has a, a big dilemma to face, which is how to be general enough so you can apply it horizontally, but it's specific enough so it really mitigates current and emerging risks. And I think that's something that we will see as uh, we advance in the implementation of the AI Act. Although, of course, um, if, we, if we think of like normal times, I mean, I really doubt that this will be implemented before 2025. To say, uh, to say a date uh, and to launch one, I mean, you can, of course, uh, challenge me in here. And by that time, I have no idea what, what type of risks we will have. But I think that in order to be able to solve those, I would say that the key question is precisely how to is create an, a framework that is able to solve that dilemma that I mentioned before, being general and specific at the same time. Great, thanks. OK, well, uh, maybe we can turn to some questions that we've had through from the audience now. Um, so just get it up. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Yodanka, maybe this might be one for you. Um, a question from Alexandra Vella, which is, the light speed uptake of ChatGPT does not seem to indicate mistrust in the technology. Um, are we sure there is a need to regulate to improve trust under these conditions? Um, so maybe you could, we've talked a bit about trust as well before, so maybe you could um, give us your thoughts on, on this question of trust. Well, I, I think, uh, I hope you hear me without the echo, but um, I think we've seen examples of, of both, yes, user trusting, but also other users mistrusting. And I just recently read also an article where a lawyer just uh, put in chat GPT a, a request to come up with relevant case law for uh, for a case that it had to appear in front of the court. And it wrote, uh, the plea completely based on the submissions of the of chat gpt where they cited a lot of uh, cases that never existed so it was a bit of an awkward situation when that was not checked so obviously we've seen also technologies improving a lot but we've also seen for example risks of hallucinations and and there have been already this importance to know the limitations uh, of the capabilities uh, of the technology and also for providers to be transparent and also always to use this only as a tool uh, is, is quite important. So that's why I think there will be also, as mentioned, uh, need for further education, for further human oversight, uh, and also responsibilities um, for, for, uh, for how it is further shaped um, uh, and used, uh, while at the same time we, we do recognize that actually it's what 
it's capable of doing is just remarkable. And there are so many efficiencies. Uh, uh, so, so indeed, we have to just to find the right balance uh, and to to make most use of it, um, adapting also based on the different context and uses. Great, thanks. Um, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I, besides trust, there is, a, there is an issue of accuracy as well. Like these types of language models, uh, ChatGPT has been like mentioned, it scraps the internet for data. And then we cannot assume that the, all the data that we put in the internet is accurate or reliable. And that's, I think, something that goes to the root of the problem. And that's something that should be addressed, I guess. Great. Yeah. Mm. Um, OK, um, maybe this could go towards Jeremy. Um, Microsoft is hardly an SME, but uh, this question is about SMEs, so maybe from a business industry side, um, you could take it. So the question is, AI is a two-horse competition between the US and China. Regulation is necessary, but the compliance costs are high. How does the EU plan to help SMEs and compensate for those costs? I mean, maybe you can't answer on the, the how is the EU sure. planning, but um, maybe just in terms of how industry can prepare when, um, especially for sure. Well, now, and your Donka might be able to answer that a little bit better than me. I mean, there are some exceptions and different proposals for small to medium-sized enterprises from some of the compliance obligations. But it is a really good point. I mean, I think I wish there was a test uh, for every proposal that, you know, is this going to make it easier for European startups and SMEs to catch up, to launch, to roll out? And, you know, we've heard it over conferences throughout the years that if in a global comp competition, you know, if European companies you know, need to hire lawyers while others are hiring engineers, it's going to be tough to compete in that space. So the, the rules do need to be understandable. And I think you could apply that type of SME test to each of them. Now, I know within these specific rules, there are a lot of exemptions built in for startups and SMEs. But, but at the same time, you know, a, a risky product or service is a risky product or service. You know, just because it might come from a small company, shouldn't it can have still a tremendous impact. But, I do think an SME test of sorts uh, could be something done with a bit more rigor in the next European mandate. I think a lot of this is done in the, the name of startups and SMEs, uh, but when you talk to those customer segments, you know they don't have the same footprints and ability to participate in some of these discussions as others. So I think it's it's a lot to digest. You know, if you're looking at this space and a company in Europe launching in this space, there's a lot of rules. It's not just the AI Act. You have to be aware of so many other rules. And once again, if you know, that requires a lot more legal investment than engineering investment, that's going to be harder to compete, I think. But I, I do know there's a lot of exemptions that are often made, and there's other programs and funding opportunities. Uh, but Yordanka might be able to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, Yordanka, I don't know if you want to um, say anything on this. Yes, no, just to confirm indeed that uh, there are different layers, how uh, actually we are really trying, because this is a big concern, the impact on SMEs, uh, our key objective is also to give them certainty to help them and uh, for uh, certain obligations to have really proportionate approach, to have uh, derogations, uh, as mentioned um, uh, um, just before, but also to provide concrete support measures. For example, we, we will uh, implement regulatory sandboxes. We are also uh, involving SMEs in discussions on standards, because this is key standards now that are being in, developed uh, to demonstrate compliance with the legislation. They really have to be addressing the needs uh, of SMEs to be able to be implemented by them. So we are doing a lot of reach out also and efforts to involve them in this process and to really take into account their um, needs uh, to reduce fees uh, and also to provide them with other supporting tools, um, including, uh, for example, uh, yes, financial support, but also access to data, access to digital innovation hubs, um, testing and experimentation facilities, uh, so uh, in addition to the regulatory sandboxes. So all this is also part of our coordinated plan on AI, and we try to cover both regulatory exceptions, but also additional support measures to, to help them um, compete, because as I said, uh, it's also important for them to, to be able to demonstrate uh, trust. Great, thanks. Um, and we also have a question that is directed towards Matthias. So it's about um, the it's about judging the market readiness of AI technology. And the question is 
about whether politicians can do this better than companies and what criteria should be used when um, looking at how to judge readiness? That is a very good question. No, I actually don't think that politicians could, can judge that better than um, uh, the companies who are producing the technology. This is why we are talking so much about the guardrails. Uh, we are talking about what criteria we need to apply to judge this. Uh, and then we use them to understand whether something is actually working or not working. And it is a very difficult um, question to answer specifically with a part of the topic that we have been discussing today here, and that is trustworthiness and accuracy and truthfulness. And um, these are concepts that are very contextual. So, um, for example, you can use uh, an AI to produce something that is entirely fake um, in the sense that, you know, it depicts a situation that has never happened in the real world and use it for something good if you want to illustrate it. At the same time, you can use something that is not at all, um, or <laughs> was not at all, um, uh, there was no AI used at all in the uh, production of a, for example, a news item. And you can tear it out of a specific context and use it then for a purpose that uh, basically uh, is disinformation in the end. So um, what I'm saying is that um, we don't want politicians to make these judgments we want clear regulation that would then mean, for example, that um, companies need to demonstrate to us transparently what they have done, for example, to um, diminish or at least control the um, instances where, for example, uh, inaccurate, um, inaccurate, wrong information is produced. Now, for example, I'm the first one to say if someone goes to ChatGPT and asks for, let's say, a short biography of Matthias Spielkamp, and then it spits out something that is completely false, and then they publish it, who is the first person who is responsible for this? Of course, the person who asked ChatGPT to create this bio and then distribute it. Um, but we should not close our eyes from the fact that the way that these systems are put in the market, and that was uh, uh, coming back to this question that was asked beforehand, you know, 100 million users, doesn't this show that uh, the systems are trusted? Well, in a sense, yes. For example, you know, they can be trusted to produce really real life looking fake porn, you know, to, um, uh, to, to um, um, produce a campaign against someone you don't like. Now, is that the, um, the level of trust or the idea of trust that we have for those systems? Certainly not. So what we can achieve is not that we have uh, politicians in the end judge the truthfulness of this. This is, would be a horrible scenario, and I'm a free speech uh, activist uh, myself, so um, I would not condone that at all. But what we need to put in place are these guardrails that, um, ask, that require companies to do a thorough uh, investigation, first of all, into what uh, results the systems produce, and then also a control structure that looks into this and says, yes, this has been done diligently, or it hasn't been done diligently, and uh, this should also be very transparent. Great, thank you. Um, and so just as a final audience question, um, we have some messages here from someone who is working in climate change awareness, so it might be interesting to hear how you think this kind of technology might be able to be applied in the area of green tech. Um, I don't know who would be, yeah, Jeremy? Yeah, it's actually one of the segments that some of our international collaborations and even some of our uh, enterprise partners uh, have gotten most have gotten most excited about, you know, whether it's identifying you know efficiencies in buildings or whether it's in identifying efficiencies across so assembly lines, um, even during you know some of the more recent international uh, 
coming together around some of this with researchers that we've been a part of. There's different data sets that can be leveraged now in more creative ways to identify some really common patterns. And it's some of those big societal challenges that I think we frame up the AI opportunity around the most. So I can just say that that's actually one of the most exciting areas as it's kind of a joint challenge. And I think some of this regulatory discussion is also a joint challenge. Um, you're seeing a lot of exciting use cases come out of that. So. Great. That touches upon the field of opportunities, right? I think that we've been we've spent a long time discussing the challenges and, and the different risks that these technologies have. But certainly, as, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, using AI also like offers a new, wide array of opportunities to tackle like societal problems such as uh, climate change. I I know that uh, there is a lot of collaboration not only within it, within industry but also within the different NGOs and governments in trying to pull together resources to use them against climate change. And funny enough, if you would ask ChatGPT, we would probably give you a ten point list of what to do with uh, with this. So I think that it's uh, there is a lot of things to do in that regard. Great. Okay. Well, that seems like um, a good place to maybe wrap up the discussion. Um, so we'll just have some time for closing statements from each of our panelists. Um, so I will hand back to Yodanka first. Uh, well, I, I just want to thank all participants for the very, indeed, timely discussion and interesting uh, insights. They are all very relevant uh, for our ongoing legislative process. So also, as said by Dan, I think now there are already concrete proposals on the table. We all know, um, and as uh, yeah, it was mentioned, it will not be able to solve all problems, uh, so it will be an ongoing process. But what would be really important is to have a transparent and indeed feedback with all relevant parties to, to provide um, also if they wish additional input, their own views, uh, so we can take uh, the best balanced and most practical uh, approach also for how to, to regulate it now and also uh, indeed, uh, it should be high level at this stage, not preempting further implementation that can happen through standards. So there are also more processes to be followed in parallel um, for the future uh, implementation. And we do want also to engage a lot with industry. Maybe, you know, uh, our Commissioner of Britain also launched uh, an AI pact uh, to engage with industry uh, to anticipate the future implementation, prepare for the AI Act. So um, we look forward to, to continue and to engage in all those processes also together. Great. Um, Andrea? Go ahead. So just like very, very shortly, I think that uh, the conversation that we had today refers to one part of the policy cycle, if we want to say it, which is precisely the issue of assessment or analysis of the current situation and what policy proposals can we put forward to address these uh, issues. Um, I think that uh, right now, considering how timely this conversation is and considering what is going to happen tomorrow and hopefully on the next uh, few months on the AI Act, I think that we shouldn't uh, lose sight of the real problems, which are certainly implementation and enforcement. So it's good that we can come up with, uh, with ideas on how to tackle these like, uh, transparency concerns or fairness concerns or privacy concerns, which I'm surprised that it didn't, uh, that we didn't raise in this conversation. But considering that right now we more or less have an overview of, of, of the challenges that we're facing, I think that we should just like jump to the second phase, which is, uh, okay, so now that we saw that the parliament has acted on generative AI and has like put a special provisions in the AI Act, how are we going to enforce them and ensure that the AI Act is enforced in a way that it, that it really makes the whole uh, system, uh, like, you know, it, it makes sense to have uh, a regulation like this one in place. Thanks. And uh, Matthias. I, you know, I will use the last question that was asked uh, as an um, inspiration to my uh, closing statement here, because um, this um, idea of using, for example, AI to combat climate change is a lot uh, in this framework of um, the so-called AI for good narrative. You know, we can use AI for so many tremendous things. That has been said for decades. And if you look at it closely, you know, it, most of the time it was to give people the uh, impression that you had wonderful solutions. But most of the time it was solutions looking for a problem. Um, and, uh, and more than that, even, um, these systems have produced real-world harms. Am I saying that they cannot be used for good? No, I'm not saying this. 
But what I'm saying is that we need to look at the entire picture again here. And um, we can look at the resource consumption of these systems and not just generative AI, but generally the digital economy that is enormous. And it has not led to the effects that were promoted over and over again, you know, that people uh, will just um, not use transportation that much anymore and video conferences. It's not the case. You know, the, the number of uh, flight uh, travel or the uh, level of flight travel has not decreased um, except for the time in the pandemic. Um, but that was a completely different effect. And then, of course, you know, um, digitization and now AI will in the end lead to a world where we can all concentrate on what we really like to do because AI is going to take over the part of the job that are tedious, you know, and not something that we would like to do. And what has happened in the real world, we have a platform economy that really coerces people into situations where they are controlled by algorithmic management um, and basically always have to go to court if they want to change something about this. So um, I would like to ask everyone to really be cautious against this AI for good narrative that uh, this is going to make the world so much better. We are looking at a political economy here uh, and that political economy has very dominant players and these very dominant players use their power to um, increase their market share and their profit and not necessarily the benefit of uh, humanity. And Jeremy, final word. Sure. I, you know, I'm a bit more positive than that. I, I do think that we're having conversations like this, and we never want to minimize the challenges. And I don't think we do. And we'll continue to see new challenges. And I think it goes without, well, it doesn't go without saying, but I think everyone here can attest to the fact that Brussels is certainly a place that's leading the way with a lot of these regulatory discussions. So I, I think we're going to continue to have these discussions. And I think you're going to have them in different sectoral uh, fora as well. You know, the story in a manufacturing context is a bit different than the story in a financial context or a health context, and we haven't talked about that. You know, I, I think there's risks, and, it, and it's constantly a question of trade-offs, you know, and it's a question of getting the balance right. And I think the EU has an opportunity to lead there. I think they're already leading, as others have said, even in between the adoption of the AI Act and the entry into force of those rules. There's codes of conduct that have been announced. There's several international initiatives. And this is the year where all eyes are on it. So I, I think we're going to see some of these product launches. We're going to see customers using these in more exciting ways. And that's going to bring excitement. That's going to bring a lot of benefits. And there's going to bring a lot of challenges to that, too. So I'm, I think if we get the balance right, this is something where we can um, see that really profound impact that it's going to have. And I, and I like to think that that's going to be more positive than negative. Great. Well, uh, we will have to leave it there, but thank you so much to our panellists for joining today, and thank you to everyone who has tuned into the event. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your day. <laughs>